we'll get started. Uh, so welcome to our webinar, Understanding Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder. Um, my name is Bev Drew, and I am um, one of the uh, FASD prevention coordinators at the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute. And my partner, Marlene Dre, is, is with us as well. Um, she's just still letting people in, so uh, um, I'll let her work in the background while I get us started. Um, we're really excited that you joined us and excited to have Miles with us as well. Miles is uh, going to add some, some wonderful richness to uh, some of the research we put out there and then, and then he'll have stories to share, which is always great, right, Miles? <laughs> it is, it is, yes. I'll let you introduce yourself in a minute, Miles. Okay. Um, I'd like to acknowledge first that we are hosting this webinar on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis here in Saskatoon. Um, and we are recording the webinar so that it will be available to other people um, after as well, just to let you know that. Um, we have your um, microphones off and we'd appreciate if you kept yourself on mute uh, for our recording. Uh, you're welcome to open the chat box and put any questions into the chat that you have along the way. We'll either respond to them right away or we'll respond to them at the end. So we'll, uh, we'll keep our eyes on the chat box. Um, the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute, for those who don't know, is a nonprofit organization. It's been around for a long time. In fact, we're having our 40th anniversary this year. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, it's been something that is, has been around for forever. Um, and we work to prevent disabilities in children. Um, and so part of uh, a new part of the Institute is called the Early Childhood Team and the FASD Prevention Program, Marlene and myself, are part of that team. And we will be focusing some of our work in the future on really supporting young children um, from zero to five, uh, supporting their, their wellness, their growth, their um, future, you know, future development, if you will. Um, so this team is really uh, pulled together to enhance uh, children's development. And we're excited about that. Um, early childhood well-being is, is a basic human right of every child, no matter circumstances. And, and we're working toward uh, making sure that that's good. Um, our goal with this webinar is really to discuss um, how prenatal alcohol exposure uh, can impact the brain and body of a fetus growing inside. And uh, we hope that this will increase your understanding and uh, potentially lead to uh, a reduction in, in perhaps the incidence of FASD. But also um, when we have a greater understanding of what FASD is and how it's caused, we can provide more effective support for young children and, and into adulthood. Um, okay, next slide, Marlene. Thank you. And there's that handsome fellow. Miles, would you please introduce yourself and let us know uh, what's happening in your world? Miles Himmerich is a motivational speaker, a <laughs> FASD consultant. And you know, um, so obviously my name is Miles. Um, I'm an FASD consultant and I also do uh, mentoring for young adults with FASD. Um, I have been working in this field for 15 or so, 16 years, something like that. Um, and today uh, I have the opportunity to work with these two lovely young ladies and uh, kind of give a little bit of a firsthand experience to some of the stuff that we're going to talk about and be able to kind of... Uh, hopefully help you see and understand FASD differently. Um, I believe that if we can see and understand FASD differently, that's where we can start to change the conversation. And when we can start to change the conversation and have those correct conversations, 
that's where we can start to move past the, the shame and the blame and the stigma that is so much attached to FASD. So, yeah, so I'm looking forward to being able to, uh, to work with these ladies and uh, do this presentation. Thank you, Miles. That's perfect. Um, Miles also has a great sense of humor. Um, and, and so hopefully we'll, we'll see some of that shine through today. So I'm Marlene. Bev introduced me a little bit earlier, but now you get a voice to go with the face. <laughs> and so moving into talking about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. I think it comes as a surprise to a lot of people that FASD is very common. In fact, it is estimated that up to 4% of people in Canada have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And this comes from the Canada FASD Research Network. And it is more common than cerebral palsy, autism, and Down syndrome. And those are, you know, challenges that many people in Canada are quite aware of, but people just do not seem to be as aware of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And why we're not always talking about FASD is a whole other webinar that Bev won't allow me to go into, but it is exceedingly common. And the challenge for people with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is that it is often invisible. 90% of people who have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder have the same physical appearance as everybody else in Canada. So it's really only about uh, one in 10 people who have very distinctive facial features, which are kind of like the wide um, eyes that look wide set, they have, it's very flat here where the philtrum is, and they have a very thin upper lip. Those are three distinctive facial features, but most people do not have them. So when it comes to FASD, quite often one of the primary symptoms of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder can be behavior. And because people are not understanding fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and they're only seeing the behavior, quite often people are looking at a child or an adult as someone who is not cooperating, someone who is being difficult, someone who's doing it on purpose. And this can end up becoming um, very negative for all of the people involved because the person with FASD is trying his or her best and the people around the person are frustrated because they're making incorrect assumptions about the person. And we end up with unrealistic expectations because we don't always understand FASD or that someone has FASD. But if we stick back and we think about it, with cerebral palsy, we can see the symptoms of cerebral palsy. So we don't have unrealistic expectations of cerebral palsy. For someone with Down syndrome, we can recognize, because it's not invisible, that a person has Down syndrome and we don't set up unrealistic expectations for that person. And even with autism, we can quite often tell that a person has autism. So we adapt our responses and we adapt our reactions and our supports for the person. But when it comes to fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, because of its invisibility, because one of the symptoms that's most prevalent is behavior, our expectations can be quite unrealistic for people. So what we're really hoping is going to come out of today's webinar is that people are going to have a better understanding of FASD and therefore they can adapt or start to think about FASD in a different way and make it easier for everyone um, around the person, the person with FASD and people providing support. The other challenge with FASD, if you wanna call it that, is that every person with FASD is different. So today you've met Miles, so you have met Miles, but somebody else with FASD will be totally different from Miles and somebody else and somebody else. So we can't also make the assumption um, once we've learned from Miles that everybody's going to have the exact same reactions to everything as Miles. His experiences are his experiences, but they're amazing lessons for us. So when it comes to FASD, we have to think about it's individualized as well. So we make 
supports and strategies and accommodations for the person and think about the person first and then the challenges or the impact of prenatal alcohol exposure. Miles, do you have any thoughts to add to what I just said? Um, one thing, um, and it's a little bit of a challenge, I guess, in a, in a sense, is um, the saying of FASD is invisible. I think that uh, we've said that for a long time, but I think sometimes it's a matter of we are seeing FASD, but we're assuming that it's behavior, bad behavior, and we're jumping to punishment. So is it really invisible or do we have to start to better understand what we're seeing? That's just my, my challenge. That's Thank an amazing you for that challenge. Yeah, that's quite smart. Um, yeah, is it really invisible, or, yeah. or are we just not looking at it with the right eyes? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I love when doing a, a presentation with Miles is that Miles, you're not afraid to share things with me and just start to get me to look at things a little bit differently. So the next time I'm talking about FASD. I may not be talking about it being invisible. So I love the fact that we can all continue to learn. And thank you, Miles. So a pregnancy is approximately nine months or 280 days, give or take a few weeks. Um, and during that time, the baby, the fetus, is growing and developing. The cells are um, splitting and, and doubling, and each cell has its own job to do. So it knows where it needs to go and what it needs to do to create this lovely baby we are growing. Um, and alcohol, unfortunately, is a teratogen that interferes with those cells and how they grow and how they communicate with each other and um, and, and whether or not they actually even survive. So when alcohol is used during a pregnancy, it has an impact on the growth and development of that fetus. Um, and it depends on what is growing and developing at the time of drinking. So if, if um, there's drinking going on when <clears throat> the face is being formed, for example, that's when you might see some face facial differences. If it's right when the heart is developing, you might find some, some heart defects. Um, so depending on the timing and on the amount of alcohol, the impacts can be very different. And, and that really, I think, helps us to figure out why individuals with FASD look so different from one another. It's because the alcohol has an impact on them at a very different time. Um, so it affects different pieces. Um, other factors that, that will be involved there are genetics and nutrition of the mother and all kinds of things. So there's lots that is in play during a pregnancy. Um, the impact of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder or that drinking during pregnancy is that it lasts a lifetime. We do know though that if we understand <clears throat> what a child is born with and create a supportive environment, it can make a huge difference. And, uh, and children can grow and learn and develop and, and do very well. So part of that is, um, is knowing, uh, knowing the children and paying attention and then discovering you know, what to do to support them. Mm -hmm. Okay, Marlene, there you go. All right. So fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is a medical diagnosis. And Canada was the leader in changing the name of this diagnosis to FASD. So uh, many of you might be familiar with terms such as fetal alcohol syndrome, um, alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder, and, and many of the other things, uh, partial FAS. Here, it's called fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. 
and it is a spectrum. So there is a broad range uh, within the spectrum. So that means alcohol's range of impact on the person may have been different or will have been different. FASD is not outgrown. It is a medical diagnosis, you know, just like diabetes is. People don't necessarily outgrow diabetes. And there are other things that people, we don't um, outgrow. But once again, medical diagnosis and something very important for people to keep in mind. FASD is very complex, as you're going to learn more about. It's inconsistent. Uh, Bev's talked about that a little bit. Each person with FASD is different. Each child with FASD is different. Every child has strengths and challenges. One of the um, adventures, if you want to call it that, when we talk about FASD is that so often because we want to learn how to provide the best supports, <clears throat> presentations, including even part of this one, we'll be talking about these are the impacts, these are the negatives, these are the things that a person may be living with. And we have to be careful that we don't get stuck on what the impacts are. We have to take a look at the strengths. Every child, every adult has strengths. And when we work with those strengths, then we can start being more successful in what we're doing and setting everybody up more for success. So we have to keep thinking about strengths. And Miles today, I think, is going to be really good at talking about strengths and sharing you know, what his strengths have been and how they have helped him. Now, traditionally, when a person receives a medical diagnosis, they are given, um, say, medications or strategies or supports that can help them deal with uh, what they're living with or to help with the diagnosis. Diagnosis, like for diabetes, uh, insulin, recommendations to eat healthy food, to get lots of exercise. Somebody who has paralysis uh, could be given a wheelchair, given physiotherapy. But when a person starts to experience success with those other disabilities or those other diagnoses, we don't take away the supports that put them um, into a more successful place. Somebody in a wheelchair who's able to get from this place to that place successfully, we don't take away the wheelchair and say, okay, now that you've been able to do that, you don't need a wheelchair anymore. Somebody with diabetes who is starting to be living a more healthy, in a more healthy way and the diabetes is regulated, we don't take away the insulin that's providing assistance. We don't take away the healthy food and say, well, you don't need that anymore. You've been successful once. But what often happens when we're talking about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, we take away the supports once a child or an adult is successful. So that's something important to keep in mind. And we also need to remember that results can be inconsistent. A child might be very successful one day and then uh, have struggles the next day with the same thing. It's inconsistent. Keep that in mind. Once again, it's not behavior, not someone trying to be frustrating. It is someone living with a physical impact. So Miles, what mm. can you share about, um, say, your experience with the diagnosis of FASD and how people, say, have treated you and impacts and taking away help or never giving help or making incorrect assumptions? That's a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> I know. And one of the things that we talk about is, you know, when we talk about FASD, you know, just one or two questions. At a time. Keep yeah. it simple. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it simple. Yeah. Just goes should, to prove. I I'd like to learn. show how not to do it. Okay. We're always learning and growing. <laughs> um, so for myself, uh, there was little information when I was young about what FASD was. Uh, there's a diagnosis of FAS, fetal alcohol syndrome, and FAE, fetal alcohol effects. Uh, the difference being if you had facial features and they knew there's alcohol intake, then you're diagnosed with FAS, fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, if there weren't the facial features, then you're diagnosed with FAE, fetal alcohol effects. Uh, the problem that came along with that was when we started to see that individuals who may have not had the facial features, they still could be impacted just as much, if not more, than somebody who did have the facial features. So 
over the years, as things have changed and the diagnoses have um, moved on, uh, a little while ago, a couple of years ago, uh, we also had the term that they now use in the states, which in the states, which is FASD, the umbrella term, um, and so that was because it was saying everything kind of falls under this, right? So it's an umbrella term, much like uh, autism, right? Then it was changed to what the diagnosis is now of FASD with sentinel facial features without or suspected. During the time of it changing from the umbrella term to what it is now, I had the opportunity uh, as running a self-advocating group for a bunch of young adults with FASD. And I asked them what they thought about, you know, the, the change in the name of the diagnosis. And it was interesting, the feedback that we got was stop changing it because we need to know what it is. So when we go to the doctor, we can say what it is that I have. It's hard enough to say it, you know, because of all the stigma and the misinformation out there, but it's even harder if I go to the doctor and I say, I have FAE, well, FAS, well, FASD, the umbrella, no, not the umbrella term, but the FASD with sentinel facial features, yeah. I think. <laughs> so it was a matter of, we want to know what it is so we can make sense of it, right? And I thought it was quite an interesting conversation. You know, um, and the other thing was that kind of came to the point of we have FASD, we're okay with that. So let's move on and figure out how to bring in those supports, right? Um, I think that's where we get stuck a lot of times is, well, we have to change the name or we have to change the way that it's worded to bake it so that it's not harmful, right? And maybe we can get away from the, the stigma and the shame and blame. The conversation that I had with a few other young adults that I was with was that, you know, we, we're okay with it, you know, and so we just want to know how to be best supported, right? And, and that's where the focus needed to be, not necessarily about what the label was as much as what supports needed to be in place. So I think when we talk about the diagnosis, it's important to have it. It's important to go get it, to know what supports need to be put in place, but focusing on the strengths and the individual's uh, sense of purpose is what's even more important than getting maybe those four letters, right? Yeah. Very wise words. Mm -hmm. We do know that FASD is a brain-based disability and it's called that because uh, the brain develops throughout all nine months of pregnancy. So we know that if any alcohol is consumed, that the brain is affected. Um, and of course the brain is, is our motor that sort of runs the rest of our body, everything from digestion to movement uh, to speech. So um, it affects other areas. Um, Depending on alcohol's impact, someone with FASD, as Marlene said, will have a, a range of issues, uh, also a range of strengths. Um, and so um, the good news, uh, I think, is that we have learned so much about the brain in the past few decades, and we know that the brain can change. And with the right support and, and work, um, someone with FASD who has some, some damage in their brain or, or something not quite working right, um, the brain can be uh, trained to sort of work around that. It doesn't mean they won't ever have issues again in their life, but it means with the right support, um, things will work a little easier. So um, early intervention is important. The earlier we can get in there and provide those supports, the better. Um, and, and it may take a lot of practice to learn something in a different way, but it's very possible. More repetition, more practice, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. When it comes to brain communication, one way that could be used to describe it is to think of traveling from one place to another. So 
Traveling from one place to another, it can be fast or it can be slow. It depends on what road you take. So a typically developed brain sends messages as though the messages are traveling on a highway. The messages speed along, the highway is clear, there aren't potholes, and after a snowstorm, it actually might even get plowed. Although in Saskatchewan, one never knows. Sorry, that's an aside. But the messages are clear, they speed along and they get to where they need to and they're able to move quickly. A brain not affected by alcohol, as I said, may work this way. For example, a child may remember after lunch to pick up the plate and the glass and to put it in the sink and put it away without being reminded or sometimes just do it quickly after being reminded. But on a paved highway, even in Saskatchewan, a snowstorm can happen. Some of you may remember something that happened about a week ago. And in our story, the snowstorm may be something that has happened, say, in a child's household or environment, such as watching, say, a family fight or a sudden loud noise in daycare, or maybe the child's having stomach pain, but it's something that just kind of throws things off a little bit. Well, what happens then is that, you know, even for uh, someone who may have a typically developed brain, the message may move a little bit more slowly because of the snowstorm, but the message will still most likely reach the point where it needs to go to. It may reach the destination. Ah. So for a brain that may have been impacted by prenatal alcohol exposure, sending messages in the brain may be a little bit slower with some tasks, not all, but with some tasks. So it might be more like going down the one lane dirt road that has bumps and potholes. The message still successfully gets there, but it may just take a little bit longer. It's maybe got a few more things to work around before it gets there, but the message can get there. And the child may need support, may need more time to do something, and the process just might take more energy for the child or for the adult. And this can make the child tired. So that means a child with FASD may take a little bit longer after lunch to put away that plate and to put that glass in the sink, like is expected or may have been an everyday routine. And then keep in mind the impact that weather can have on say a slower, on uh, say a dirt road or a gravel road. Whereas the highway may stay fairly smooth, the gravel dirt road, you know, if there's been a lot of rain, it maybe gets a little bit more slushy or mushy and it's harder for things to move through. The potholes may be a little bit deeper or filled with water so you don't know that they're there. So the travel can be a little bit differently when there has been an impact say like a snowstorm. So for a child with FASD who's experiencing, say, a fight in the family, a loud noise in daycare or something else, it might be a lot more challenging for that child. Perhaps the message doesn't get there at all because the snow or the impact has changed, has blocked the road. The child may forget to put dishes away or to do things, even with several reminders may need to take several reminders or prompts to get dressed to go outside. Some things, things can have an sometimes things can have an impact that will just take longer or may stop the message from going there. That can be exceedingly frustrating for the child. It can be very frustrating for the people around the child. So just wanted to get people to think a little bit differently how brain communication may work and to start thinking about things a little bit differently when you may have a child or be working with an adult where things just aren't maybe totally inconsistent or sometimes take slower than what you might expect them to. So just a thought about that. Now to get an FASD diagnosis, um, um, uh, doctors and, and the assessors look at 10 different areas. Um, and they're, they're here on the slide. I'm not going to go into each one in great detail. This is two slides, so I'll just, I'll just mention a few of these um, or highlight the, the main pieces, but they'll look at motor skills. They'll look at how the brain is formed and how it functions. 
Um, they'll look at cognition, the way you think and put things together. Uh, language is assessed. Um, academic achievement when a child is older, math, etc. cetera. Um, they look at memory and they look at attention. Um, so how you can stay on task and focus. Um, Marlene, go to the next slide. I will eventually. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it, sometimes? Mm -hmm. hmm. And they also look at executive function, which is kind of like the, the boss of the brain, how, how it's organized and put together, how you can get, uh, you know, abstract thinking going and all kinds of things like following instructions. Affect regulation, which is our emotions, how we control our emotions, how we react to stress, etc. And then that social skills, adaptive behavior, and, and how we talk with our friends, and, and really it's the life skills, right? Um, so those are the, the 10 areas that um, assessors will take a look at. And to have an FASD diagnosis, you need to have a, a significant delay in three or more areas. And that's when a diagnosis will, uh, will happen. Um, sensory issues are not assessed in, in the diagnosis, but it's absolutely a piece of what people with FASD experience. And Miles, maybe I can turn it over to you now to just talk about what kinds of things do you struggle with and, and what things are you really good at? Um, uh, for me, um, it's still always a kind of learning process. Uh, mm -hmm. I try to be very self-aware when I'm experiencing something to see how I'm feeling, how I'm reacting to that situation, and also to be able to kind of look back and think about how maybe I reacted when I was younger mm -hmm. and how maybe I, I didn't think things through. You know, I, I was in the moment kind of thing, right? Um, you know, being able to uh, process things at the same speed as everybody else, that was something that was a struggle for me. And we live in a very fast world that, you know, we doesn't allow people the time to put their thoughts out there and, and take that time to pause and think and, and, you know, really connect with each other. It's very much, hi, how are you? I'm good. Good to hear. Nice to see you. Okay, bye. Right. And we get into that routine. You know, you're at the grocery store, wherever you are. And it's like, hello, how's your day? Oh, it's good. Thanks. Bye bye. You know, and you could have been in a car accident and spilt your coffee all over the floor and missed that new Justin Bieber song that just came out. And so you're actually not having a good day. But when you went into the store and they said, how's your day going? They're like, oh, it's good. Thank you because we're so used to that. We, you know, and if you are an individual where being able to process those things, it can take you longer, you know, that can really play a big role in your ability to do well in school, right? Mm -hmm. Even in your ability to respond to other people in basic conversations. Um, being able to show uh, correct emotions, that's something that I've actually learned uh, over the last couple of years that I'm not the best at because I would uh, say to my friend, I'd be like, oh, so excited. We're going to go watch wrestling. And, and I'd be all excited. And then I might be going on a date with my partner. And she's like, oh, we're going to go to this uh, theater. We're going to watch the movie. And then we'll go for dinner. Aren't you excited? I'm like, yeah, it'll be okay. It'll be good. And she's like, okay, well, if you're excited, tell your face because you don't look excited. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, no, I am. And I'd be like, oh, this weekend, though, I'm going to go to Ryan's house and we're going to watch that wrestling event. Yeah, the Royal Rumble that we've watched 104 times. Oh, so excited. I love it. I can't wait. And she would be upset because she thinks, so you're more excited to go hang out with your friend and watch a guy's jumping around in their underwear wrestling each other. And it's one you've seen hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't realize was I've been to my friend's house. We've watched the video. I can relate to those feelings. I can understand what those feelings are. So I know how to um, express them. 
right? Where we're going to a new restaurant. I haven't been there before, so I don't know if I'm going to like the food and the environment and all that. And we're going to a new movie, so I don't know if I'll like it. So I don't know how to react properly, right? And she wants me to be excited, but it's an unknown Mm -hmm. situation for me, right? So being able to show the right emotions can be hard. And, you know, and then I'll try and they'll be like, oh, yes, I am very excited. Smile. And it still doesn't work. Right. So I think a lot of times it's for myself, just being able to look how all the time throughout the day, I'm having these different experiences and how they relate to FASD and, you know, maybe what tools and strategies I'm putting in place. Right. How I've learned to be able to understand how to, Um, support myself when my sensory issues are heightened right so I I will wear sunglasses and I'll put on a hoodie and I'll put on cologne that I can handle the smell of those kinds of things that I've learned to use as tools and strategies to uh, be successful throughout what looks to be just normal day-to-day things right so Yeah. Thank you, Miles. That's really very insightful. I mean, you you know so much about yourself. Um, And I remember being at a presentation with you. I think one of your real strengths is that you see and have tremendous empathy for people and their experiences. You know, I've watched you in action. And uh, I think that is a strength that you have in spades. Thank Thank you. Yeah, I know you also struggle with sensory impacts, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this uh, this photo here that you have is uh, one that I took not even that long ago, maybe a month or two ago, something like that. Um, I was on the ferry and um, I, I think I may have not had much sleep the night before. And so when I don't sleep, my um, sensory issues are even heightened even more. And when you have heightened sensory issues, um, it's things that affect people, the light, the noise, the smells, things like that. But it's to a point where it's actually physically painful, right? And so uh, a light will actually be physically painful. A smell will actually be physically painful. And so here I was on the ferry and I was charging my phone. And so I couldn't have my uh, music playing and they had the um, hockey game uh, blasting on the speakers. And then there's people walking all beside me and there's just so much going on. And I was so physically uncomfortable. I I just wanted to scream, Mm -hmm. right? But I knew that that's not going to look good, right? You know, had I been a five, six-year-old child and reacted that way, people would understand and they'd probably maybe look and go, oh, isn't that cute? But as a grown man, when you do that, people don't always think it's cute. I mean, they'll think I'm cute, but they don't think my behavior is cute, right? Because they don't understand it. So finding ways to be able to, you know, try to get by, right? As you can see in the picture here, I've got the sunglasses on, I've got my hoodie on, you know, I put the earphones in, even though I didn't have the music, you know, and so I'm trying to put these things into place, these these tools and strategies uh, that can help me to feel a little bit more comfortable in that kind of situation, so, yeah. Yeah. It's like you're trying to shelter yourself from the outside world so that you can mm-hmm. cope. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and the interesting thing about that is this was on a ferry, so it didn't look too off. But mm-hmm. what happens when the kid in school does that, puts the glasses on and puts the hoodie up? Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, they get in trouble, right? Mm-hmm. And put your hoodie down and, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. A lot of teachers or, or, or people in, you know, in a house or, or somewhere would just say, you know, that that's not respectful, you know, put that down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take those sunglasses off inside. Yeah. Yep. 
uh, but they're not thinking about what, what that child is experiencing. Or adult. Or adult, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where should we go from here, Marlene? Uh, jump into health issues. Okay. Uh, Miles, you could probably even address most of this based on work that you have done with mm -hmm. your um, cohorts and leadership group. Yeah. Um... I had the opportunity with uh, two colleagues of mine that uh, also have FASD. We worked together with some people at the uh, University of BC and we put together a health survey and we sent it out and it went to over 500 people um, all over the world. We had people in Norway, Australia, the States, Canada, um, individuals filling out this survey and when they returned the survey after they filled it out, we started calculating the results of their answers. And so what we did was we asked, um, do you have scoliosis? And then we gave the options of yes, no, or don't know. Um, we asked, I believe it was over 200 different uh, areas of health, anywhere from bone uh, to vision, um, hearing. Uh, we asked about uh, possible cancers, many different things like that. And what we ended up finding out was some really, um, really astounding information. One of the things that we found was the individuals that responded to the survey, again, this was over 500 people, um, the average age of people responding was 27 and a half years of age. The reason that that was important was we had people in their 20s, 30s, uh, talking about having things like early onset dementia which is defined as you would get that when you're in your 60s. We had individuals in their 20s and 30s um, having early onset dementia, which made it, I believe it was 186 times higher for individuals with FASD than general population to have early onset dementia. We had uh, women reporting going through premenopause or full menopause um, before they were in their early 20s. Um, we have, uh, for myself, I personally, I have scoliosis, osteoarthritis, hip dysplasia, degenerative disc disease in my neck, um, quite a number of different health issues. But the thing is that the arthritis, the scoliosis, all of those were things I had and was pain and discomfort I was experiencing when I was 12, 13 years old. So what we found was that though it seems like the brain development uh, can sometimes take longer in certain areas, it's almost like our bodies are breaking down faster. And it makes sense if you think about the fact that we know alcohol intake during the pregnancy uh, affects the brain development. Does it not make sense that the alcohol would affect the development of the bones and the tissues and the joints? It's not going to go, excuse me, bones and tissues. I'm just going to work my way up to the brain. It's obviously going to be affecting those things. And so looking at FASD as a whole body diagnosis uh, is something that has been uh, really interesting uh, findings that we've had. Uh, we actually just got um, the survey itself published in a book uh, probably about four or five months ago. So uh, getting the results published there. And so that was really exciting. But uh, it was really uh, very eye-opening because it's something now that we know we need to look at. And it's something that we need to have parents and caregivers and loved ones uh, be aware of this when their child that's 10, 11, 12 years old is saying that their knees hurt. Maybe it's not growing pains. Maybe they have osteoarthritis. Maybe they have hip dysplasia, scoliosis, because it is very possible is what we found now. So, yeah. Yeah, that was very important research that really highlighted 
how FASD is not just a brain disability, but can mm -hmm. be you know, the whole body can be affected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. I will just mention, we're, we had a beautiful plan for this webinar and I'm jumping in and trying to throw it off for Beth. Oh, you're not throwing anything off. <laughs> uh, I'll just mention that this chart on health issues and there is another chart on brain domains. Uh, these come from uh, Canada FASD Research Network and they have a database of diagnoses. They are the first, um, well, Canada is the first in the world to actually have a database on diagnosis. And so what they have done here is this chart comes from what they have learned from diagnoses that have been shared with them from across Canada when it comes to health issues. And so um, people with no FASD, you know, would be the blue line and the FASD is the yellow line. So it definitely shows that in those areas, there's been an impact due to alcohol. So I just wanted to share where that was from. Thank you. So FASD is often misdiagnosed. Uh, some of the things that it has been diagnosed as has been autism, um, oppositional defiant behavior, um, ADHD. ADHD, that's one of the big ones. So you can find um, a lot of children with those diagnoses, but the problem is they are really living with prenatal alcohol exposure and so what may be working for a child with autism or um, ADHD or something else is not necessarily going to work for a child or an adult uh, with FASD. So it is really frustrating for everyone when FASD is mixed diagnosed. So it's really better if you can get people in to get an appropriate diagnosis so that we can, so it can be figured out what is the best way to provide supports and find out what's going to work. Um, as mentioned earlier, behavior can be a symptom of FASD. And then as what Miles has shown us is it's not only because of say the brain-based impacts of prenatal alcohol exposure, but also those physical aspects such as aching knees or aching joints or stomach problems that people may not even be aware of. And if you think about that, how that can impact a child or an adult and say even say their behaviors. And another challenge that many people, and I know you've talked about it too, Miles, is sleep is quite a challenge. So it's often misdiagnosed as something else and given maybe the wrong supports and it's often misunderstood. And as I've mentioned before, quite often that's related to um, behaviors where people aren't understanding what is happening. And when we're not providing the right supports or not understanding or being there in the way that we could be, this lack of support or appropriate supports can lead to what used to be called secondary disabilities. Now it's called adverse impacts or secondary challenges, but it may be dropping out of school where uh, a student has just had enough of being misunderstood, being labeled, um, not being treated well by peers or other people who aren't understanding. They may get in trouble with the law as a victim because many people are victimized or they may end up falling in with the wrong group and becoming in trouble with the law as a perpetrator. Um, they might end up being homeless if they've had some trouble, maybe lost their job a few times and just have no way of making money or people aren't taking them in because they're not understanding why things are happening or they're missing out on the strengths or not understanding that this person has tried so many times, is so diligent, is just such a hard worker, but has some challenges because of the disability. And they can end up having mental health problems too. And so there are many things that we could make so much better if we could get an appropriate diagnosis and if we had more people understanding fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Uh, what might you be able to share, Miles, based on, say, experiences where with misdiagnosis or not being understood? I think one of the important things to keep in our mind is as parents, support workers, caregivers, uh, whatever your relationship may be to an individual with FASD, 
there's times you're going to be frustrated. There's times you're going to throw your hands up in the air and shake your head and go like, why? When is he going to get in? When is she going to understand? When, you know, think of all the times that you may be frustrated and tired. What about that individual that feels those feelings, hears those things every day, all day long? You know, when, when I was late getting up from uh, bed and my parents were frustrated at me because I was going to be late again. And then the teachers were frustrated at me because I was late for class again. And then they were frustrated because I didn't have my homework done. And then the kids were frustrated because I was being weird and silly and different. In all of those situations, my parents were frustrated and then I left and their day went on. Teachers were frustrated. I moved on to another class. Their day went on. Kids were frustrated. I went away. Their day went on. But for me, I was in that feeling of frustration and misunderstanding all day long. You don't understand what's going on. You don't get why I'm doing what I'm doing. But you know what? I don't either. And that's what's the tougher part is I look in the mirror and say to myself, why can't I just be like everybody else? Or you're right. I did do that yesterday. Why can't I do it today? You think you're tired and frustrated? Imagine what it's like for an individual who is having to hear that and feel that all the time. time. Right. What was that? No, nothing. I thought I was saying something. So just, um, I think that's something that's really important to understand is the biggest things that you can offer is to be that safe person and offer a safe place for that individual. So maybe that means when they come home, they're not doing homework, right? You know, and, and maybe they didn't put their shoes away um, or they didn't hang their jacket up. Maybe we can let that go for today because there's going to be plenty of other things that I'm going to do that you can get on me about, right? But maybe I don't need you on me about everything because I've had people on you about stuff all day long and I've been on myself too. So allow yourself to be that person that if you're their loved one, their support, their caregiver, whatever your relationship may be, try to be that one person that is that safe person that allows them to come to a safe place. Whether that's home, that's your office, that's your time when you guys go walk in the park, just that time away from all of this judgment and all of these labels and all of this stuff, just to have time with a person that I can feel safe and okay with is huge and can make a huge difference. More wise words, Miles, well said. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all the places you were in were safe throughout mm -hmm. your life, right? If you went to yeah. school and it felt like a safe place and home yeah. and community and a birthday party, whatever, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, it would be nice. And um, it doesn't mean that the, the safe adults in life can't teach you things and help you learn and grow but doing it gently and with compassion and understanding would be yeah. so much better wouldn't it mm -hmm. yeah and we we certainly know that success is absolutely possible um, for children and adults with FASD um, Miles is an amazing example he has led a, a very successful life he's absolutely had some struggles during his life we've we've heard uh you know, in other presentations about some of the things you've gone through, but you have been very successful. Um, and what we need to help children and adults be successful is that understanding and compassion, um, some knowledge about where their difficulties lay. So that diagnosis that tells us, you know, here's the areas that really need help. And then we can work to uh, boost those up. Um, that's, that's, huge right that will really help that person to grow and learn but to use their strengths to to get there is is ideal um but absolutely it takes a reframe in our mind right 
instead of saying that kid's being bad, that kid is just on my nerves, right? No, that kid is struggling with something in the environment or within their body, and they need a safe, supportive person to be able to come to. Um, we've got about four minutes left. Um, so I wonder, Miles, if you would just end with what has helped you to be successful in your life? And then we'll, we'll possibly have a few minutes for questions. So if anyone has a question, put it in the chat box. Uh, so yeah, I'll uh, just answer quickly with three, three things. Hmm. One is routine, two is repetition. Routine and repetition by understanding what my day is gonna look like, having an idea of what's happening gives a sense of comfort. Mm -hmm. Being able to do something over and over again gives me the opportunity to better understand it. Maybe I struggle with grocery shopping because of all my sensory issues, but if I go to the store and I know that I get the same six, seven things then I can actually be successful at grocery shopping, right? So that routine and repetition. And the third one is sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. You have to have a reason to get up every day. There has to be a reason to, to do what it is that you were put on this earth to do, to find that purpose. So help be that guide because individuals are gonna spend anywhere from say five, six, to 10 to 12 years in something called school that is going to give a lot of mixed signals on what their direction in life should be and a lot of mixed signals on what success actually looks like. Maybe I don't graduate and go become an accountant, but maybe I love and I'm great with animals and I start working towards that when I'm in grade seven. There's my sense of purpose. I get to work with these animals and I'm really good at that, right? Mm -hmm. So focusing on trying to implement routine or repetition and finding that sense of purpose. Yeah, wise. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots there that uh, really makes a difference for you. That routine, having a structure in your day, repetition so you can get things over and over and, and master them and learn them and feel comfortable. And then that sense of purpose. Here's where I'm going in my life. And this is what's important to me. Yeah. So the repetition makes me think of your uh, wrestling show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're very comfortable with that, right? Yes. Yes. There are a few questions about, or one question about diagnosis. And, and someone, Marlene, you have responded about uh, where it's done. Uh, we can give you more information about that um, in an email. Uh, with some specifics if you'd like. Um, if there are no other questions, um, Miles, do you want to have the last word? Um, <clears throat> I think it's just important to make sure that we're having these conversations. Because like I said earlier, that's how we get past the shame and blame and the stigma of FASD mm -hmm. is talking about it. Because a lot of this stuff that we covered here will translate over to other disabilities such as autism, ADD, ADHD. So understanding that those ones are normalized and as a society, we're okay talking about these other diagnoses and these other disabilities, we should be about FASD too, right? So being able to change that conversation and be able to have that conversation is what's gonna move us in the right direction. So there you go. Great. Um, we want to thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Um, it's been wonderful having Miles here to really uh, support our, mm -hmm. our, our talk. Um, makes it a lot more real for everybody to hear from you, Miles. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, anything to add, Marlene? Uh, thank you for joining us. The webinar has been recorded and it will be on our website under learning opportunities in about two weeks or so. It might be sooner. You can check it out. And I will be sending out an email uh, with an evaluation on today's session. So I would really appreciate it if uh, everyone who has been able to take part in this 
can uh, respond to the survey evaluation. It helps us with the work we do, helps gives us ideas on potential uh, future webinars. And uh, yeah, we just really appreciate everybody having joined us to learn a little bit more about FASD. It's not easy to do everything in one hour. There is so much more to understanding FASD, but um, it might even sometimes come down to if something is happening with you know, someone, you know, say a child or whatever, and you're thinking, hmm, this is really strange. There seem to be some, a lot of things that I might not have expected to be going on. You may want to think about whether or not it may be FASD and look at trying to get a diagnosis. And if you can't get a diagnosis, just put strategies, do things to provide support as best you can. And when things seem to be working, think, well, maybe I can try that again. Good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, Thank you, Miles, we'll see for joining us another time. Thank you, everybody. Good to see you, Miles. Good to see you too, my friends. <laughs> bye, bye, everyone. <laughs>